Hi, I'm Tom Zimmerman from the EMDR podcast. This episode is about um, why my version of flash approaches don't have a lot of the elements that other um, other scripts may have built into them. And uh, these may include bilateral. Um, four blinks does not have bilateral. It doesn't have counting. It doesn't have distractive talking. Um, it doesn't have deep breathing. And in short, um, my script doesn't have these in them because they're not active ingredients. Um, but if you like them, I want to start by saying that if you like them, feel free to do them. There's no reason why you can't do them. But I do want to highlight the possibility that adding things to a really, really simple brownie mix may, may introduce problems where there might not otherwise be problems. So, and this may be especially true if we're asking the client um, to do things that may distract them from their central task uh, on this journey and in this dance. So if you can easily, effortlessly, and consistently do something without a particular component, we can start to wonder if that component might be extraneous. Um, is it important? Is it central? Um, obviously flash approaches are very, very flexible and they work with a lot of different things that you might, you might throw into the mix, but learning how to do this well by working with the most elemental forms first, and then purposefully adding elements to solve specific problems is what I would recommend. Um, a lot of the reason that um, bilateral or possibly counting or possibly, you know, um, encouraging the client to do a lot of talking and then disrupting their ability to talk is really does come from this assumption that flash may get most of its efficacy from taxing working memory. And my only point is that's a theory. <laughs> that is one hypothesis about why flash-like approaches may work. And what my suggestion is, is that if you want to really understand one of the most simple, compelling reasons why flash-like approaches might work, just look at memory reconsolidation. It's right there. We activate a memory. We encourage the client to have an experience that contradicts or that disconfirms the expectation in that, in that memory. Um, this is how humans generally um, transform implicit information. It's not really more, more complicated than that. So let's look about what we know about flash approaches. Um, and particularly, let's look at what seems to be active in this four blinks approach in which I've kind of stripped things down. Um, and again, flash approaches are among the most explicit memory reconsolidation approaches we have. And if we ground our understanding in that, um, then we're going to be, we're not going to be too confused about what we're doing and why we're doing it. And memory reconsolidation has a much more solid theoretical, conceptual, experiential footing than the black box of, of taxing working memory. Because we can say, whatever we do, we can say, well, this thing that we're doing is taxing working memory when we're not even entirely sure that taxing working memory is the most active of the active ingredients in Flash. It's just a theory, just a hypothesis. So um, the risk in asking the client to do more in, in the four blinks approach particularly, if we ask them to do more than simply lightly activate container, calm scene blinks, lightly activate container, calm scene blinks, um, it's possible that, that they may be too distracted to keep finding their way back into the calm scene. Finding their way back into the calm scene after the blinks is the client's primary task. And if we're having them do a whole bunch of other tasks, um, it, may be, it may be interfering with their ability to find their way back. Um, slow bilateral, which is in there, um, logically and sensibly in part to, um, to kind of interfere if it comes out of a disrupting working memory model. 
Um, slow bilateral makes sense in EMDR resourcing. It just does. There are tons of reasons why it's in there. I'm not sure that it makes sense in flash reprocessing. Um, I think that it's there largely because flash was developed by an EMDR therapist and it was incubated in an EMDR training and institutional context. But flash itself is growing up. So if that, that's what it was born out of. It's growing up, it's getting its own voice. It's letting us know who it is um, in ways that may be separate from how us grown-ups need it to be. So part of what I'm proposing is that we listen to it. We listen to what it has to tell us about, about, um, about how we heal. Let, listen to what it tells us um, now that it's maturing about, about how it works and about what it needs and let's get the things it doesn't necessarily need out of the way. Deep breathing makes sense in phases four, five, and six of EMDR therapy. It can help modulate distress, right? That the client is being guided to notice in EMDR, we're digesting distress. Um, it's the free resource that clients get um, to use in their reprocessing, and it's helpful. It's the free little tap of the brake that we get. Um, in flash, clients aren't sitting with distress. Um, the whole system is designed to avoid clients sitting in distress. Um, we're kind of doing musical chairs um, in the calm scene, going in and out of the calm scene and finding our way back in. Okay, so we think of it as a seesaw, right? Lightly activate container, calm scene blinks. Lightly activate container, calm scene blinks. So think about this. We want to keep this seesaw going. We don't want to do something that really slows down this process without a really good and compelling reason. Um, and we definitely don't want to do things that may promote noticing or experiencing things outside of the calm scene. So deep breath is another shift in orientation that may not be important. It may be an extraneous variable. So I'm gonna ask you, why is deep breathing in many scripts of flash other than because it's similarly situated in the MDR, right? All I'm saying is it makes perfect sense for that breath to be inserted in the check-ins in the MDR. It doesn't really make that much sense in flash. And I can't imagine a client has been harmed by taking this deep breath but let's realize what we're doing. Let's look at it. And if it's not a variable that is needed and required, let's consider pulling it out so that we can see this and its components in the simplest forms and make sure that we're adding things in because they're needed and because they're helpful and for reasons that we can make sense of and justify. Many of Phil Manfield's approaches involve talking um, talking about the calm scene, using language, getting up in this part of the brain. Um, and that, what that really does is it makes the positive engaging focus something that we're talking about and engaging in, what can, which can be really, really helpful, particularly in the context of your calm scene. I mean, you know, that is your calm scene, talking about your hobby, your interest, your grandchild, your whatever, that is your calm scene. And we go in and out of that. Um, we go in and out of that by blinking. Um, we can do it that way, but talking about the scene or the process and experiencing the scene and the process may be different, right? Maybe different processes. So we want to make sure that if we're going to use talking, as our, um, as in a sense, as a substitute for our, you know, our calm scene, our calm process, as, as that, we want to make sure that the client is having an experience that, that does this, you know, this really somatically contradict the, um, the expectation that's in that bad memory. And my sense is, is that the healthier the client's nervous system the more likely, you know, verbal engagement is likely to work. We activate, we pivot away from it. In a relatively healthy nervous system, that activation start to diminish. They're going to be able to be in this calm scene. We can look right back at it, activate, pivot away from it. 
Um, and the, the, the talking about it, as we do anytime when a client may be activated, the talking about it may also be a kind of a functional type of container. So again, we lightly activate something, we pivot away from it, we talk over here, we disrupt our ability to, in some ways, even continue our sentence or continue our process. And then we go back, we activate, we pivot over here. It may be a lot easier to do that um, with a client for whom simply pivoting and activating may in fact cause a trash can fire and pivoting away from it may cause processes that they may struggle to contain absent a more, a more concrete container. When I first got trained, I did it with Ricky Greenwald's team and they provided the option of two different scripts. You can do one with bilateral or you could do one that did counting. And in the counting, you blink every count of five, right? So one, two, three, four, blink, six, seven, okay? And my clients, I did, I, I decided in the practicum and when I started working with clients to use the counting version. My clients did well with the counting approach, but they also do just fine without it. I'm gonna say that again. My clients do well with the counting approach, but they do just as well without it. Um, but at least in this version, it's the therapist that's doing the counting so that at least that um, process isn't necessarily overtaxing the client in a way that may keep them from going in and out of the calm scene. And again, we don't want to ask the client to do so much that they're struggling keeping this seesaw going, right? At the end of the day, the point is that they need to be finding their way in and out of this calm scene. And if they're doing, if they're not doing that, it doesn't matter what else you do, right? You can have them dance, you can have them do whatever you want to do. If they're not finding their way, whether that calm scene is conversation, whether that calm scene is petting an animal, whether that calm scene is watching a video, whether that calm scene is imagining a beach, doesn't matter. If they're not finding their way, if they're not having an experience, right? Somatic, body-based, experiential process that's contradicting the, the bad memory, um, it doesn't really matter what we do or what else we throw into the process. The four blinks approach was developed specifically for complex trauma and by simplifying the process, um, we can do flash approaches really reliably, consistently and predictably. And if we remove this much as we can, that may be extraneous, if something's going wrong, then it's probably going wrong um, because too much content is being activated uh, because containering isn't working or because the calm scene isn't compelling enough. So if we boil down to light activation, container, calm scene blinks, um, light activation, container, calm scene blinks, if there's a problem, um, check those three places. So um, again, thank you for joining. Um, again, if what you're doing is working, you don't have a problem. If what you're doing is helping clients clear targets reliably, consistently, predictably, um, keep doing it. There's, there's nothing, there's nothing um, that you need anyone to really um, assist you with. Keep doing it. As a matter of fact, you know, do more of it, keep at it. But if for some reason, you know, flash consistently, you know, your clients jump and they don't quite make it there, I want to help you explore ways that we can simplify the process simplify our conceptualization, simplify the, the pathway the clients may be on, and very quickly, very easily identify where there may be problems, strategically intervene to address those problems so that clients reliably, predictably, and safely end in sunshine. Um, ideally, session after session after session. So thanks a lot. Um, thanks for everything that you do in the world and uh, be in touch.